So, like I said, we're going to be diving into understanding your memo for right at the beginning, and then we'll be getting into correlation as we proceed into Unit 3. Yay, Unit 3. Not feeling the love. All right, fine. So, basically, your memo, which you'll be doing uh, in the next unit, Unit 4, toward the end of the semester, is a three-page analysis. It's going to be limited to three pages. It's going to be an analysis of the data that I'm going to give you. So the first stage of that analysis is figuring out what you want to analyze. If you go to my website, I don't know why it's labeled macro. I need to fix that. But if you go to my website and you see on the link here at the bottom, memo data sets, this is the data that you will be using. If you want to add to that data, you can, but most people don't. In fact, no one ever really adds the data because there's a fair amount of data in there. Uh, but if you do find more variables, I'm always happy to add them to my data set. The data set occurs on, in, in two ways. One, it defaults. For some reason, I have it default into the estate level data. I'm going to change that later. And this is individual U.S. states, as well as the District of Columbia. And then various variables taking place uh, at roughly 2012. I think we have some data from 2010, and we have I added election data from 2016 very recently. I went to... Yep, stats, memo data, set us at the bottom. And then what is this one? This is for the memo that we so you need this in order to do your um, uh, which is doable. So we may change. I, I changed it a little bit. I added some stuff. I thought at one point, I looked at it like three weeks ago, and I thought at one point it was like a bunch of countries and then like, ah, if you go to the country data, uh, yeah. So I think I was I think I was fixing something in the state level there and when I saved it. It will it saves not only on the tab but also like where you are at the tab. So so that's why. So yeah, if you go over the country, you can see the country one too. So you actually have two options. Um, but both of these are of course cross-sectional. So they're it's all roughly at the same time. The state level data is on 2010. Uh, 2012 lab is 2012. This is, uh, the country level data is about 2005, 2006, and mostly 2005. No, as a side note, don't get too hung up on the fact that like, I'm a 2012 data, sometimes you see this 2010 data, and there's some 2010 population data based on some demographics, and then like I said, 2016 data as well for elections. Um, while cross-sectional requires that they're all at the same time, there's a little bit of give there. Like, there's no reason to think that, like, I don't know, Alabama is now, like, filled with uh, American uh, Indians and, like, or Alaska Natives. Or, like, it's suddenly, like, more than, like, 1% Asian. Like, it's probably not changing that much year to year. So there's good reason to think that this demographic data is more or less constant. It should be that much different than 2012, so it's fine. It would be different if this was, like, company data. And I was like, oh, the revenues from 2010 are probably the same as the revenues from 2012. Like, that seemed unlikely. See, the economy is growing, a lot of other things are happening. But this is more or less going to be relatively stable. So just because it doesn't perfectly match uh, doesn't mean it's a problem. This is close enough. And most of this is 20, uh, 2012. And we have some 2016 over here, uh, over 2010. Most of it's all about this. So if you don't know the country level data, most of it's 2005, I'm sure one or two of this, because of constraints I have in collecting this data, I'm sure some of these uh, variables are not on 2005 exactly. Some I think are 2004, some maybe 2006, um, but again, it's all close enough for our purposes. What you will be doing for your data, uh, for, for your proposal, is you will be identifying one independent variable. What's an independent variable? A variable that's not changed by anything else. It's like, I don't know. I'm sorry, you, yeah, it's not the meaning of anything else. Sorry, I misspoke. Uh, let, let, let's start with the, I'm sorry, I misspoke. You, you will be defining, you will be identifying one dependent variable, one dependent variable. What's, what will be a dependent variable? Um, 
So when you uh, change something, the dependent variable is kind of the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in other words, yeah, exactly. You're trying to find out something that you're curious as to why it happens. Like maybe you're curious about the murder rate in different countries. So you see this variable is the murder rate in different countries. Then you will identify three independent variables which cause this dependent one. Naturally, that means that all your other independent variables have to be in this data set. You can't like if you're using country level data, you can't say, well, the different incomes in different U.S. states cause the murder rates in Australia. It doesn't make any sense what you're doing. So you have to pick within that particular data set. So if we want to be curious about the murder rates in different countries, I might say, you know, I think that the alcohol consumption in that country affects the murder rate, causes the murder rate. So this would be alcohol would be my independent variable. And murder rate will be my dependent variable. What would be a story as to why alcohol could, could cause murder rates? What would be the logic there? What do you mean? So does, does vehicular manslaughter count as murder? I mean, that's a good story. You can think bigger, though. You can think bigger than that. So... So that would be one reason, right? Like, you know, people get drunk, and so then they they decide to do hit and runs, or they are driving recklessly, and I guess vehicular manslaughter maybe count as murder. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know, but maybe. Uh, but we can think even bigger than that. Like, also too, if you're drunk, you're maybe just more likely to get angry and shoot someone. Right. So and so we can tell a story as to why if a country started drinking more, that country would then have all the things equal more murders. I need three of those relationships for your proposal. So we have one story as to what causes murder rates. We now need two more independent variables and a story for what causes murder rates. For example, uh, GDP. GDP per capita is the same thing as average income. So what would be the connection maybe between GDP and murder rates? Income in that country is high, so less people are likely to commit murder because they have good job, good paying jobs in their head. Yeah, yeah, and they don't want to risk it. Right? So that would be a logical story. Note that this is completely distinct from the alcohol consumption story. Completely different variable, and that's what you want. You want very different things. Yeah, so you don't have to, like, you don't have to, like, your claim doesn't have to be true, correct? Right? Nope. It doesn't logically make sense. Right. And note, we are in no way actually referencing the data. I'm only focused on the variables. Because you want, you don't want to use just one observation. You want to use as many observations as you can. So you're trying to understand the overall pattern. People often, when they do this, they like talk about one particular country, like, oh, let's talk about Australia. Like, I don't care about Australia, just Australia. I care about all the countries. Why are you focusing on Australia? That's not relevant. We need to know an overarching pattern. You're trying to tell a story as to if you change this variable, then this variable would, would result in a change. If you change this variable, then this variable would result in a change. So one dependent variable, three independent variables, and a story for each. Yeah. So you're saying like don't focus too much on one country. It's like don't focus at all on one country. Like in general, just think of uh, GDP, uh, GDP uh, countries have higher growth rate. Uh, so focus like one country. Yeah. Not the most. So it's not even hard to look at the instructions. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to know the relationship. Well, that was an example. Is that an example? Well, the larger GDP and the rate. So that was just an example of what you could use. Um, we could go a different example, like if you're curious about 
Maybe in the U.S. state data, you're curious about why income is different in different in different states, and so you might say, well, uh, all the school all matters get expended. Maybe that causes high income. And so we have total spending uh, per pupil right here, and you can uh, try to connect that to that one, and you would tell a story as to why that is. So why would spending affect income? And that's really what the emphasis on, is that story. That would be another example. Any questions on this? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll show you an example of what I did. Oh, this is a proposal of my that, That's a general framework. So let me emphasize, too, this is the assignment sheet, so let me just emphasize a couple of rules for this. One, don't do boring stuff. Like, I often see people say, well, uh, I have income and consumption data. Right here. So I'm going to say states with, I want to try to determine what causes consumption and what are my predictors will be income. I think that if people have more money, they spend more money. I mean, no shit, they spend more money than they have more income. That's super boring. Your job is to try to be creative and interesting. Don't do boring, obvious connections like that. That's rule one. Don't be boring. Be creative. Two, also make the independent variables very different from one another. So I have like aggregated assault data and I also have like robbery data. Don't use both of those, they're very similar. Try to be very, very different. The reasons that we'll talk about, I think probably next week if we get to it, uh, you want things to be very, very different. So I, uh, I organize these, so especially for the state, it's easy to do with the state and all that. I organize these in groups. And so one rule of thumb is to pick things from different groups. Like, don't pick reading and math scores. It's boring. That, those are very similar. Pick, like, reading scores and percent Obama. Like, that's really, those are really different. Any questions on that? Well, you'd have to come up with a story. That's the assignment. Mm, it, I, I, you know what? I think it's more fun if you're creative than if you uh, do something boring. So, if you come up with a really interesting explanation, now like, that's probably not true, but I'm gonna, uh, um, I'm gonna be a lot better to you than if you come up with something boring. So. They're on the side of creativity. Uh, it's kind of more fun that way. And yeah, just don't do anything really Question. Yeah? For your example, can you point out what you're doing? Readers vote more for volunteers than math. 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 That's interesting. The problem is reading and math scores are very similar to each other, so it's going to be hard to untangle the effects. Like, it would be one thing if we had, like, a state with, like, really low reading scores or really high math scores, and then a state with really high math scores or really low reading scores, a bunch of those like that, and then we could sort of untangle the, the effects. But as we'll talk about, reading and math are so closely connected, so highly correlated, you can't really untangle. That's a great question. But I don't think we have the data to answer it. I would encourage you to be different. Also, don't use the state's population or country's population data. I have state data, uh, I don't know, it's not the same, like, well, it's not the same, 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 it's not uh, the population for the individual countries. Don't use this variable as an independent or a dependent variable. This variable is here. 
so I can make adjustments on other variables. Like, I had, uh, I was a, a while ago, I got so many ways to be which is like a really interesting variable, but I only had it in total for say. Obviously, California is going to have more kids up for adoption than Wyoming because California has a hell of a lot more people in Wyoming. So what's more interesting is that children when be adopted adjusted for population, and that's what this column is right here. This is the interesting column. So don't use population as a variable, and don't use anything that should be adjusted for population. As a variable. Use the version that's adjusted for population. Don't use this one, the raw number of kids waiting to be adopted. Use this one, the kids waiting to be adopted for 100 pounds. Don't use total Trump, use percent Trump. So if I chose um, which one would the best? Well, I mean, that's what we have to figure out. So we have to figure out how to figure out how to see the population of uh, the participation rate varies widely. Alabama, 8% of the eight uh, of eligible people took the SAT. And what is that? Delaware, 100% of people took the SAT. Now, who do you think, of the people who took the SAT, who do you think did better? Alabama or Delaware? Well, let's take a look. Delaware got 1362. Alabama got 1596. In fact, Arkansas got even higher, 1680. What do you think is going on? And you'll see this pattern over and over again. Places with higher participation rates have lower scores. It's not perfect, but it's a clear tendency. What do you think is going on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Some states have rules, and some areas within the states have rules. Everyone has to take it, regardless of one to or not. Uh, so obviously, there's going to be um, a bias built into the data. Right. A self-selection bias. So don't use this variable if you're trying to measure uh, how like, smart. Uh, a state is. Use this variable, the adjusted combined, because the adjusted combined adjusts for the participation rate. And if you're curious as to how I did that, we'll be talking more about the tools later, but if you go into the description, I think I can a brief overview of how I did it. But if you don't even know how I did it, you can simply know the purposes of this assignment that was the end. That's how I did it. It's adjust for population, adjust for participation rates. This was found by first doing stuff that we'll talk about. Yeah, uh, so do you take the maximum? That's for the memo, not for the proposal. The proposal's going to be short. This is the proposal. Yeah, this is the proposal. Yeah. So, to give you an idea, let's take a look at the uh, example. So, I purposely use data that you won't be using because I didn't want to, in my example, take away someone's, you know, 
what someone wanted to do. Because obviously if I give you it, then you're not really doing it. So this is an example using completely different data you don't, uh, that you won't be using. I was curious what determines student exam scores. And I have data on not just how well students do, but things like how they did on homework, how long it took them to take the exam, uh, if they're male or female, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and uh, how many years of schooling they have, uh, or if they're a freshman versus a senior versus whatever. So this is how I set it up. I gave them basic introduction, which you don't arguably need, but it's nice to have. I will use four variables to predict exam score. Homework grade, time spent on the exam, gender in your school. I have a course I'm using, I personally require you to do three, but I used four because I was curious. And as an example of a justification, I have to justify each one of these. So as an example of justification, I say, well, students who know more should do better on exams. Well, this is impossible to measure directly. How well the student, is that the point of the exam after all? How well the student did on homework should correlate with how much the student knows. Since the homework and the exam cover the same material, students who depend on the homework have demonstrated greater understanding. Uh, the relevant idea is the exam. There. In other words, homework should come off the exam. This is a proxy. If you have homework, you probably know more than for you to run out of places. Students who take more time should also do better, as it makes it, should we say, more likely that students will complete all questions and remember relevant ideas. Women usually perform worse on exam scores, it's like they want to do this, but there's some data that suggests it is, so I have a citation there. And students with more college level experience should do better than the first year students. Um, we use a school to have a great chance and another. Done. That was my justification. I had, in this case, four independent variables. All I want to claim caused the dependent variable of exam scores, so I had four stories. And that's the proposal. Okay, yeah, done. Do you need a works cited page section? No. I just realized I wanted to include uh, gender, but I couldn't justify that with pure logic, so I had to cite something to justify it. But you, in all likelihood, will not need to use any citations. The second page is just some additional information, like um, we all know why it's quite you should care, it's not necessary, but you'll need it for the papers or when you start again. Uh, I don't talk about any particular numbers or data points or observations because this is about the variables, the variables in general. Uh, I reference myself. So we, you want to see the like, like this? No, 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 you don't have to do that. That was just for you if you want to know why I did things the way they did in the exam. Okay, so you only want one thing. You only want one thing. One thing. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I came up with a reasonable proxy for measuring involved knowledge. Right, Any questions? No. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do we have to use the one from the demo data set, or can we find our own sets of data? If you can find your own, that is fine. Um, but it's hard to get data sometimes, not just because it's you know easy to find the data, it's hard to get into a format that's easy to analyze. So. That's why I put over here, uh, I have it in Excel and it's ready to go. But if you want to use other data, that's fine. You just have to essentially show me where you found the data so that, you know, this isn't just... Because sometimes people are like, I bet IQ matters. An average IQ in a, in a state matters. It's like, yeah, I bet it does too. Do you have average IQ based on state? Do you have that data? And they're like, no, but I'm sure I can find it. Nah, I don't know. If you can find it, that's great. I love it. That cited in the proposal, your point. Yeah. Yeah, I don't care this location. I mean, you don't even necessarily need a citation. That's only if you absolutely have to rely on it for your justification. So, Mr. No, no, this, this is just a proposal. Yeah. The memo is completely different. Uh, and if you go to, if you want to see, um, what the memo will look like, you can go to unit 4 and the memo is 2. And I have a sample memo here, which was based on the sample proposal. So you can see how that, that sample proposal, if you're curious, becomes a memo. Uh, but you have to, yeah. But obviously, I'm not recording. 
Do you have sample tables? Uh, I believe I did. I believe I made those. Uh, no. It was almost like a scatter plot between the Well, I upgraded a little bit. Um, I'm asking for a little bit more than just a, a scatter plot. I'm asking for descriptive statistics, regression analysis, correlation data. So, I mean, I can very easily make that because. That's all stuff, maybe, or um, maybe, uh, what's it called? Um, no, that's all I ever made in the memo, so I can afford it. Yeah. Um, uh, I have an idea for the Any other questions? So you said I can do other than the memo, or is that too simple? I mean, it's, I, I, I don't think it's, so if I do it's like on the border, so I, I think it's fine, but obviously you have to come up with all those. Well, you have to come up with a story as to why I'm so much of a problem. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, okay, great. So, let's discuss what we're talking about today. Let's actually, let's, um, let's dive into, well, no, we don't need that yet. We will get to that. We need this. So, we have all of this data, which means we are going to need to be able to understand a connection between us. And we have language for that. We call it correlation. How many of you have ever heard the word correlation before? Yes? So, what does correlation mean? There's no proof that they're not each other. They just happen at the same time, right? So we think in terms of two variables are correlated. They can either be positively correlated or negatively correlated. Positively correlated simply means that the values change in the same direction. Example, we have good data on the more years of school you have, the higher your income. And those things are positively correlated. As one increases, the other increases. As one decreases, the other decreases. It can be a noisy relationship, to be sure. But you, you would see that kind of positive. Similarly, we have a negative correlation. Negatively correlated variables means that values change in the opposite direction. Or values change in the opposite As one increases, the other decreases, and vice versa. So, um, probably like, I don't know, uh, cigarettes per day and lifespan. People who smoke a lot tend to live less. People who smoke a little tend to live longer. Can anyone give me any other examples of positive two variables that are positively correlated or two variables that are negatively correlated? Anyone? Time, studying, and time That's that's a great one. Yes, that's positive. <laughs> 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 no, 
Unless you're going to tell me for negative, it's time spent partying in Great Earn, right? I didn't see that. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know. It's, it's easy to blend it. But yeah, it's a great example, right? Great minds think alike, right? Yeah. So yeah, so the more money you spend on a car, probably the faster the car goes, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, there is, of course, a level of noisiness. There's, of course, degrees of correlation. Like, that's very strongly correlated. That's very weakly correlated. They're still possibly correlated as one increases the other increase. But you can see that for the one on the right, there's more other things going on. You can see that here, too, it's actually spectrum. You can imagine this is perfectly positively correlated. We could draw a straight line and hit all the points. Here it's much noisier. So we have a measurement to describe how strong or how weak a correlation is, and that is called the correlation If it's positive, that means it's some sort of positive correlation. If it's negative, that means it's some sort of negative correlation. If it's zero or around zero, that means there's no correlation at all. The closer it gets to zero, the weaker the correlation. If it is one, is perfectly positive, if it is negative one, it's perfectly negative, perfectly negatively correlated. I tried to do this on the number line, on this way, that way. Here, it's the one is on the left, the negative one is on the right. It's the same idea. Eight, that's pretty strong. Point eight is pretty strong correlation. Point four, ah, oh, it's kind of weak. Zero, obviously, nothing's going on. Don't be too wrapped up in the idea of it being exactly zero. I will show you how to talk, uh, how to self calculate uh, the correlation coefficient. But if you get a correlation coefficient of 0 0.07, and you get 0 0.07 for correlation coefficient, like, ah, it's positively correlated. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Four dollars. Well, uh, 0.07, that's basically zero. So there are no hard, fast rules as to when something becomes highly correlated or no correlation. There's no clean lines like we did with statistical significance. But there is a sort of come on, don't bullshit me factor. Any questions? Yeah, what does that say at the bottom? Oh, yeah, so I sort of got away from it. Uh, negative one is perfectly negatively correlated. Mm -hmm. Positive one is perfectly cor positive correlated, and uh, zero is no correlation at all. Okay. Yeah. So this is of course a range. So on the note, you have to use the Yep. Any questions? Great. So 
So, one example of variables that are positively correlated are age and height. Obviously, it doesn't really matter anymore. Like once you get to like a certain age, like after the age of, I think people stop growing around what teenage years, roughly twenties. Yeah. So after the twenties, doesn't matter. But if we're looking in like, you know, starting maybe age of like I don't know six to twelve, if we look at that range. And there's height. Here's age. We clearly see a uh, positive or negative correlation. Positive. positive, I totally agree. Positive. I might look like that. So imagine I look at this and I'm like, oh, well, obviously height causes age. There's a very clear connection between the two. So as you get taller, you age. And if I wanted to live forever, I'll just stay short forever. I'll eat like lots of food that keeps me short. All right, and I'll basically be immortal. Does that make sense? No, why not? Well, okay, but why not? So what mistake am I making? What's actually going on? Why is there a correlation here? Uh-huh. Okay. So uh, how do you know? Like, what, 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 why is there a connection then if age doesn't cause height? I'm sorry, if, if, uh, if height doesn't cause age. If height doesn't cause age, what's, what's going on? Uh, age causes height. Well, you know, so I, I think you said age doesn't cause that maybe this song maybe I just heard you. No, I think I just Okay. Well, let's just go with that. So you've been absolutely right, right? So if not I, I look at these two things. I assume that there's a causation. Not only do I assume there's a causation, I assume I know what the causation is, but I am making a mistake. I am making the mistake of reverse causation. Correlation does not equal causation. Because one, there's reverse causation. Just because you see two variables correlated doesn't mean you the, the first instinct as to what causes what is right. You could be getting them backwards. Could be mixing up. your dependent and independent variables. It's possible, for example, that income doesn't cause murder. It's possible that murder causes income. And if you stop killing each other, we can actually get some economic growth. It's possible. That is a story that also makes sense. Uh, we also see a positive correlation too between uh, lifespan and income as well across countries. People say, "Oh, well, if you get wealthier, then maybe you can uh, then you can afford better health care, better health services, better sanitation, so you live longer." So maybe that makes sense. You know what also makes sense is if you get healthier, you can then. Uh, work better, and you're not so concerned about surviving day to day. You can make maybe more, more long-term investments, and that causes wealth. So it's not it's health causes income rather than income causes health. It's hard to figure out. Another one. Any questions on this one? Here's another one. Uh, speaking of crime. Do crime and ice cream. If you plot the data over here, particular area, you will see a positive correlation between crime and ice cream. I guarantee you this correlation exists. 
So, what's going on? Well, you say that ice cream doesn't cause crime. What? What? Oh, I said weather. Oh, you said weather. Okay. Are you saying that ice cream doesn't cause crime? Yeah. Yeah. Are you saying crime doesn't cause ice cream? Yes. So, then I have to tell the story about making people like really hot time on ice cream and like on the cigarette and start treating people. Or maybe. Or maybe like in such a criminal environment that people are concerned about the day in their life and so they use ice cream as comfort food. I like your weather story. What's your weather story? Um, during the summertime, ice cream is still in the breeze. Uh, same thing with crime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Criminals only point out. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So, though we have this very clear correlation, there's actually no connection between these two variables because some third thing is causing both of them. Both of these are dependent, and there's some underlying independent variable I was talking about. And we call that a confounding variable. Question. Yeah. I mean, I suppose, but you know, if we were to change this to like murder rates, we would still have that. But you're, you're, you're sort of, you know, I, mean, I guess, you're thinking at the same time. The same idea, like, why if it's only just in the Maybe, maybe it's like because they have like, maybe it's because it's doing a live stream and everything, and so it's easier to run away from that. He is in a vehicle. He could run the town. More like this slash or something. Maybe it's slash his time. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so maybe, right? You know, and it's really just, so this is where these conversations and what, what's, you know, what you can, where the conversation comes. Like, maybe that seems reasonable, maybe it doesn't seem reasonable, it takes some thinking about. But it's pretty clear that the weather story probably is the stronger influence. Third variable causes the two other variables. So what's tricky sometimes, confounding variables are fascinating because by definition, you have to try to discover what they are. They're hard to think about. Um, they're hidden. And so you have to think about is this really what's going on? Is there a connection between these two things? Or is it something else entirely? Uh, I am also in the examples too. There's a greater portion of agricultural workers lower infant mortality. They have infant mortality numbers. And I have agricultural. And they're needing to support it. If you have more agricultural workers, you have less infant mortality. I believe it was negative. Or was it the other way around? Well, maybe that was the reason. I don't think that was the reason. Or we thought it was maybe something else I can't find. Don't get too hung up, though. By this mantra. Is this a great mantra? This is a really great point. It's a really important point in statistics. It's a really important point in life. Don't get obsessed with it and use it to dismiss every possible thing you can encounter. This kid clearly broke the television. Just because I'm near the television and there's something I was playing with is through it, yes, okay, those things are correlated, but it doesn't mean causation. Correlation is a really helpful tool. But while you shouldn't get obsessed with it, you shouldn't ignore it either. I used to think correlation implied causation. But then I took a statistics course, and now I don't. 
Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Can we tell a story as to why, having taken the course, you now understand this idea? Does that make sense? Is that a story that can make sense? Can you tell a story as to why people who tend to take statistics courses also understand this idea? Yes. Yes, you could. Why? What's the story? Mm -hmm. There, yeah, end of story, right? Exactly. So correlation doesn't mean causation, but it doesn't mean uh, no causation either. It means you should pay attention to this thing. Let's think about it some more. Any other questions? Okay, let's start new talk. So let's pull up data set four. This is a smaller version of the data that you'll be working with. It's the same number of observations, but it's fewer variables. It's really easy to work with. And let's imagine I'm curious if there's a connection between population density and murder rates. We can probably imagine there could be one, right? Like, if there's greater population density, then it's easier to kill people, or you can murder them and then disappear in the great crowds. Uh, let's just find out if there's a correlation there. So, the secret to Excel, if you always want to do something, I'm sure you do it. What do you do? You go to the Or even faster than that. You want to try to use some function. Probably oh, built in there. Let's see if two variables are correlated. Ah, there you go. You can just this hit equals and start typing baby, which I'm looking for. Oh, there it is. That's is our correlation function. C O R R E L. And it's asking you for two arrays. Because again, correlations are based on two variables, just like a scatter plot. So, I'm going to highlight. I two to I two thirty seven because obviously I don't want I one because that's the name of the variable. Comma J two J two thirty seven. And also points to take it in two. Yeah, what did you get? Yeah. So is there a correlation there? No, 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 not really, right? Yeah, yeah. I picked um, population density and murder rates. Surprisingly, nothing there. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. We really care about that whether the land is, even if it doesn't correlate the fact that it's a negative number. Well, it is a negative number, but it's such a, it's still really close to zero. Remember I've seen earlier, like, oh, it's point all five, it's five, it's a yeah, it's not a lot. Like, again, you could argue, well, it's super, super weak because it's basically point one. I'm like, like, yeah, but not really. Like, certainly between point one. A negative point one, a positive point one, you're going to still probably at all. And, and so, uh, it wouldn't matter, by the way, if I swap these, if I put uh, the J first and then the I? No. No, you're right. Why do you think it doesn't matter? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's the way to know, right? I'm, I'm maybe just changing the axis. I'm flipping it around on the one that's going on. And that shouldn't change the correlation at all. Then you know exactly the same number. So Excel doesn't care what order you put it in. There's no order there. Just put it in whenever you feel like. Any questions? Goodness, it would be nice 
Because I was hoping for uh, I was hoping for a strong correlation. We could talk about it. I mean, yeah, strong correlation. Would be nice if we had a strong correlation. Oh, I mean, maybe maybe I can just find one. So I have to take this and I get out of the old school. Well, let's get this correlation between population density and agricultural land. Oh, not really anything there is. Well, maybe there's a connection between age of first marriage and that was kind of weak too. I was a little sorry for that. Maybe, but you know, we can do this all day, like quite literally all day. How many combinations do you think we have here? There's a lot, right? Because you would do population with GDP per capita, population with the unemployment rate, with this unemployment rate, with this unemployment rate, with this other unemployment, with the age of first marriage, with population density, with murder rate, with agricultural land, and get it all the way down. And then you do that again. Uh, GDP per capita, we already did this one, so we go with this one and this one. This. There's actually hundreds of combinations. We would be here all day. It would be so annoying. Oh, God. But thankfully, it's not something built in which makes it faster. So, I'm going to ask you to go into the final section. Then we're going to activate uh, the uh, data analysis option. So go into options here. And then under the ads, like some ads go, and click that analysis tool pack. Remember that analysis tool pack we've been working with before when we did our histogram. Again, I'll do that again for those who didn't follow. File, options, add-ins. Go right at the bottom there, and then go up, and click cell add-ins, and then click the analysis tool back. And under the data, you should see data analysis. You all have that? Data analysis? Click the analysis, and you will see the correlation option. I think it defaults to script is we go to correlation. This option makes a correlation table of all the variables. So you don't get just one correlation coefficient at a time. You can get all of them all at once in a super convenient table. Mm -hmm. And it's under the data tab. You're going to want to hit that correlation option. And then what can you see? You get that. Oops. And uh, I already did this in the last class. So well, I'll show you what's going to say. So, does anyone have this screen right here? Yes? A correlation. So the first thing you want to do is you want to highlight basically everything. Start from B1 and go all the way out to I think it's AC237. Yeah, you want to include, you definitely want to include the first one. So we're going to do B1 to AC237. Making sure you include that first row. So do B1, not B2. So we're well, you don't want to highlight column A. But you do want to highlight uh, B to the right, so everything else. Knowing what column is what is really important. Knowing what variable is what is going to be very important. So you want to hit label in first row. Make sure to hit label in first row. Finally, select the output range, range of up, and select A239. This indicates the upper left hand corner of a table it's going to make for you. Because you told it its labels are in first row, it knows what the variable names are. So it will take this row and copy it down right here, starting at B. 
And then we'll take this row as well, make it a column, and put the names right here of the variables in A. So this will be population GDP per capita over 15 unemployment, as this will be population GDP per capita over 15 unemployment. Is everyone good? And what's nice about doing it this way is because you established this as your corner, then this, which is frozen, will match with this. If you still have your correlation coefficient uh, up in one of the cells, when you hit OK, you don't want to hear a little warning saying you're going to overwrite something this next one. Don't worry, no, you don't need that anymore. I don't know how you're going, so I you get something that looks like this. <laughs> oh, I just selected this cell. So if you want to scroll down, and all the way down, oh, yeah. And then to the left. And you want to go, let them bring the grab that. Yeah, the 231 and the 841 as well. This is something that A is what I recommend. Yeah. Does everyone get this? Yep. Yes? Yeah, I'm going to go back to the analysis. Correlation. So you, you started at B2. Yeah, so it treated it treated Afghanistan as names of some. So you want to make that B1. Yeah. So yeah, if you got numbers here, it's because you only highlighted up to B2 in selected labels. So it thinks Afghanistan's data values are labels. You want to go all the way up to uh, to the first row. So, appreciate then what's going on. Each one of these cells represents a correlation coefficient. And the correlation coefficient it represents is the intersection between the two cells. So, for example, if you look at GDP per capita and alcohol consumption per, I think that's per year or something? Per adult, sorry. Alcohol consumption per adult, the correlation coefficient is 0 0.3464. If you want to know what the correlate, uh, what it is for, say, age of first marriage and births per a thousand, that's right here at negative 0.677. That makes sense, right? The younger kids have, uh, the younger kids get married, and the more kids people have, because they have more time to have kids. That makes sense. So it's sort of fun to see what things are highly correlated, what things are strongly correlated. Uh, you will note, though, that there is this line of ones right here. Why is there a line of ones here? Exactly. That is, this is sort of this is this is a standard thing you see on all of them. This oh, just know let's let us know we know what we're doing. These are all ones because obviously GDP per capita perfectly correlates with GDP per capita. This area is completely blank. Why is this area blank? Exactly, we already did it. What do you mean, Michael? Exactly. Yeah, over 15 unemployment GDP per capita is right here, uh, but it's just called GDP per capita and over 15 unemployment. Exactly. As Michael points out, it's exactly the same variable. So there's no need to be redundant. The weird thing is when you scroll down and you see these three. This one, which is negative one, that's suspicious. And that's positive one, also suspicious. And that's negative one, also suspicious. What the hell's going on there? Are we gonna claim that 
aid received here as a percent of gross national income is perfectly negatively correlated with the over 15 unemployment rate? That seems unlikely. Does anyone know what's going on? It's perfect. Oh, yeah, I know. One of the like one of the variables like is created from the other variables. Nope. Let me tell you what. That's a good guess, but nope. That's what's happening here. One way to define perfect correlation is if you could draw a line through all the oscillations. So. This is perfectly positively correlated because we can draw a line into everything, right? Well, let's imagine though, if we scroll up, we see there's a lot of empty data. Well, so I mean, this is a lot of data. We don't have a lot of data on the phone. It's a lot of misinformation. Which means sometimes. There's also a lot of missing observations for some of the other ones, like, like the Synergy Eye. Yeah. And so it turns out that for these variables that seem to be perfectly correlated, it's because we only have like two pairs. There's like two observations that only have data for both of them. Can you draw a straight line through all observations? Yes. That doesn't mean it's perfectly correlated. It just means that we don't have enough information. It is the imprecise sample, essentially. So that's why those things are coming out this way. Not because like we found some like amazing thing, but because we just don't have a lot of information. So it's thinking it's perfectly correlated, but it's not. Now granted, three is not much better than two. But three would now reveal perfect correlation. So some of these other ones, which might seem like they're perfectly correlated, may not actually be because we don't have a lot of overlap. But obviously, the, the negative one, the positive one, the negative one, there's not a lot going on there. We don't have a lot of that. Any questions? was an exclamation point there too yeah. yeah so you know if you have like two pairs you can claim they're perfectly correlated one and l251 combination there's literally only one observation that has like well it's either one or zero i can't remember but when there's no overlap at all then uh it says well i can't extrapolate anything from here in fact note what l251 is What's that combination? And? ATC does a percent of gross national income, and ATC has a percent of gross national income. Amazingly, there is no country that is both getting aid and giving aid. So naturally, we don't have any observations there, so we can't claim a correlation. Good cast like that brought that up. We got that one there. Okay. Any other questions? So what's what's relatively like the highest natural correlation? I mean 
I've seen them like in, in, you see more, I think, when you go into um, you do the same thing with the um, U.S. state state data because there's a lot of observations that are very close. Like you'll see a really high correlation between um, like uh, mass scores and verbal scores in SAT um, because the obvious reason is so close or uh, any averaging coming out. So. I mean, you can see that on 9.5 pretty easily. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Just because, by the way, we saw very little, there's basically no correlation between uh, between murder rates and population density, doesn't mean they're not affected one another. Because there could be other factors that are sort of canceling each other out. When you parse out all the factors, you do get a correlation. Uh, this idea called controls is something we'll talk about next week. All right, let's move forward. I'm going to give you a little preview of what we'll be talking about next class. Because we're, again, behind and we can catch up a little bit. So we agree that age causes height, right? We can solve that problem. Let's just pick up here. The question is, though, if age increases, how much does height on average increase? That's when we get into something called regression analysis, which will be the bread and butter of your mouth. Let's imagine that you did not know someone's age. You knew it was somewhere between 6 and 12, but you didn't really know anything beyond that. Uh, and you want to know how, how tall they were. Your best guess is, by definition, the average height of 6 to 12-year-olds. Make sense? But let's imagine you did know their age. What would be your best guess? Of their height. Like, let's imagine that they're, you know, that they're six. Would you go lower than the average or higher than the average? If you knew they were six years old? Oh, the average at six, yeah. But not the average of six to 12 year olds. Right. So if you don't know their age, you would might pick the average of six to 12 year olds. If you know their age, you would pick the best guess at six. So what we can do is we can draw a line that best fits this data. That's regression analysis. It looks maybe like that. That's probably pretty good. That's not great, but that's pretty good. I'm going to actually add another observation to make it better. <laughs> I feel like that's probably, there we go, that's probably right. Do a little bit over there. We can summarize this line. Height equals beta zero, which is our intercept, plus beta one times age plus epsilon. This is our slope. This is our y-intercept. And this is our residual. This is what, this is the mathematical version of the best fit line. So I'm going to sh quickly show you sort of what's going on with this best fit line and kind of just a quick introduction is what it looks like. And then I will give you a short primer as to how it was found, because we only have like two minutes left. Here is our independent variable, age. Here is our dependent variable, height. So let's take a look at this person right here. This person maybe is about seven years old. 
but they're a lot taller than we would expect at seven. That difference between what we would predict and what they actually are is called the residual. What are some of the other reasons besides age as a term of height? Diet. Anything else? Genetics. Two big ones. Diet, maybe exercise. Do we think maybe in which now sort of curious to where exercise matter? Um, right, so a few other things, right? These can explain the residual. The residual is saying, look, other things are happening. They could be other variables. They could just be randomness, but other things are happening too. We don't claim to know those things. We just know that, well, there's some stuff left over. Sometimes it's called the error term. The goal of this line is to take all these residuals, square that value, add up all those squared values, and that result is the smallest it could possibly be. If you were to draw a different line, this sum of squared residuals would be larger. Mathematically, what's going on, this is the residual sum of squared equation. Equals to the nth observation, starting with the first. Where y hat is the predicted value, the predicted independent, uh, predicted dependent variable, and y i is the observed value. So we would take that difference, that vertical difference, and square it. And then we would take this vertical difference and square it. And this vertical difference and square it. This one's right on the line, so that vertical difference is zero. That's a vertical difference, that's a vertical. All these residuals, we would square them and then take all those squared values and sum them up. That's a summation notation. And we would get residual sum of squares. This line is the line of best fit. It is the smallest possible RS. If we draw any other line, we would get a bigger RSS. Line of best fit. minimizes our access. This equation right here has, a, has an important similarity to this equation which you know. Y equals mx plus b. What is m? What, what, what is m in this equation? Slope. Slope is right here. What we call a beta 1. What is the B in this equation? Y intercept, but we call it beta zero. Why did we do something different? It's because later we will add in, a uh, we'll be able to add in multiple variables. So we want to label them beta one, beta two, beta three for the multiple different slopes. We add this residual because we're recognizing to actually find out the height, you have an estimated value, and then maybe you go up or maybe you go down to get the actual value. But this part is our predicted value. Because the residual is by definition the difference between the observed and the predicted. Okay, we will see more of this next class. I will see you then.